All right, in this homework assignment, we are taking a look at the support for the pedestrian walkway. It is comprised of a horizontal beam that's attached to the wall at the far left, and that is a fully rigid connection, meaning transfer of moment and shear and axial force. And then we have a rigid connection and joint between the beam to the column, and the column is fixed rigidly to the support below. All right, the setup of the walkway is such that it only imposes reactions or really force effects to the beam at the connecting points which are at the mid span at the far left right close to the support at that far left. Those reactions have been provided to us at 48 kips for a specific load case. Right, that wall again is a rigid wall big old monolithic thing and we have full moment transfer this is a fixed end at A and then the top of this concrete pedestal we have full moment transfer in from that uh, steel beam into the concrete column such that uh, the in senior engineer is um, dis has decided that that concrete pedestal up here is so stiff that it represents a fixed end and so we're going to take a look at a whole bunch of different aspects of this system. One, let's just from a, a static equilibrium perspective, we've got this fixed end at the left, fixed end at the lower right. That's one, two, three reaction components, vertical, horizontal, and the moment at both ends. That's three plus three, so a total of six reaction components that are helping to support whatever the loads are and transfer into the foundation. Right, the conditions of equilibrium here are we have three equations of equilibrium from 2D, sum of force of the X, sum of force of the Y, and we can't have any rotational effects of sum of moments, all equaling zero, but we don't have any releases, so therefore all we've got from equilibrium is just three conditions, and that means we've got three times more reaction components that we, than the minimum that we need. That makes the system statically indeterminate to the third degree. This is the level of redundancy. If we were to have one of these reaction components fail, we might be able to redistribute the loading effects to other reaction components and be just fine. We have the theoretical possibility of having three different reaction components potentially fail and still being able to re uh, support the applied loads, potentially, because with that redistribution there may end up being uh, other overloads. Right. In this next couple of tasks, what we're going to try to do is get a sense of what the beam might need to be size-wise in, in this design kind of example. And so what we're going to do is look at this beam from two extreme perspectives. One that says that, okay, we've got the fixed end, that's the wall over at the right, but I'm sorry, at the left, but at the right we have a column, and that column is going to provide some sort of rotational restraint to the end of this beam, and it, the, the two extremes are that it provides free restraint, or it provides free restraint, meaning it, provide, uh, it provides no resistance to rotation, or it provides total ro resistance to rotation. So that's either fixed fixed or fixed uh, roller. And if we look at the fixed roller case as one extreme situation, then in our fixed end moment table we find out that the end moment at the left fixed end is going to be 3PL over 16. Um, this is an easy thing to derive and we will come back to it later in the course. But you can do it for strength of materials. But we've given that moment from the rest of the equilibrium equations and we can figure out what these reactions are. The right reaction is 5 sixteenths, a little bit more than a quarter of the mid-span load. The other applied load is way right close to the support. So we've got all of it going into that support plus the leftover from the mid-span load to get to 11P over 16. Right? Then that means that the moment diagram is going to of course be triangular because we have nothing but point loads. We're ignoring the self-weight of the beam which will turn out to be almost insignificant. And our left-hand moment is negative 216 kip foot. The max positive for this situation becomes 180 kip foot. We just come along and cut the beam just to the right of the point load. Here's our free body diagram that goes with that. And so then when we do that equilibrium and substitute numbers in, we get the 180. 
right? Then the question is, well, is that an upper bound or lower bound for that, uh, that value? And so now let's go back and think about what happens with the deflections here. In this case, we've allowed this end to rotate freely. Let's think, though, for a moment what happens when, when we have a fixed fixed case. We've got little frowny face pieces at the end, and then we've got this smiley face in the, the middle. If we were to have a fixed fix and then suddenly release or break the moment connection here, this thing would immediately want to pop down more into the kind of shape that we have here. In other words, this situation is the, is the more flexible of these two, that is the fixed roller one. And if it's more flexible, then that means that we not only have probably larger maximum uh, displacements, but we also have larger curvature. And with moment curvature relationship, m equal ei kappa, then if the curvature is larger, so is the moment. And so this seems to me that this is going to be an upper bound estimate, not a lower bound estimate. Right, at least for that maximum positive moment. Now that other extreme case where now we look at the column being so stiff compared to the beam that it prevents any rotation now at that, um, that particular joint. Now we're fixed fixed. We look on our table PL over 8 at both ends, both frowny face. We've got um, a symmetric situation so of course it's going to turn out that the, uh, the apply point load will be ha go to half and half we can get that also from the basic equilibrium, not just assumptions of symmetry. And then we draw the shear diagram, goes up by P over 2, comes over to the load, goes down by P. Now we're at negative P over 2, come over flat. No distributed forces. We are ignoring the self-weight of the beam. It closes off, and that gives us then a moment diagram that actually has the max positive and max negative moments the same magnitude at PL over 8. There's a total net change of PL over 4 from the end to the middle, right? And that's just given to us by P over 2 times L over 2, or PL over 4, to get us that net change. Right? And so this should be a lower bound, and sure enough it is. PL over 8 is less than 5 PL over 32, which is the equivalent of what we have in that other case. Uh, from a numerical standpoint, look, we got 180 for the former case, and we got 144 when we substitute in for P being 48 kips and L being 24 feet. Um, to get to those two numbers. So now we bracketed the results and really the argument for the upper lower bound has everything to do with that stiffness related kinds of uh, perspective. Right? So now we're ready with a maximum uh, potential maximum positive moment with let's take the upper bound we work that the basic stress equation is sigma max in a cross section is equal to m over the moment divided by the elastic section modulus just a, a shortened version of sigma equals mc over i at the outer fibers. Rework it because we know the material and we know the allowable bending stress. So the s required, the geometry required, is m max divided by sigma allowable. 180 kip feet. Turn it into to kip inches, right? Because we're going to take that and divide by kips per square inch so that we end up with inches cubed. So 180 times 12 divided by 30, that gets you the 72 cubic inches. Right? And so from that, we can come look up in our table. These are organized from least weight to biggest weight. You've got 30 pounds per foot, ranging all the way up to 55 pounds per foot. A W14 is about 14 inches deep, and the 24 would be about 24 inches deep. And so, in, of course, with that increase in self-weight, you got more area in the cross-section. You see that reflected here as well come over here to the section modulus and we find out that the first one that has at least enough section modulus is 81.6. Now we could choose the 16 by 45. It's going to weigh just slightly heavier and it would be right at the, the required section modulus. But why not get the biggest, stiffest section we can, get a little extra out of it. We do pay a penalty. It's a little skinnier the, and in the steel design class you'll find out what that might mean for you or, or whether it really is important or not. But we'll, we'll go ahead and try the 21 by 44 to build now a computer model that will give us a more sophisticated analysis of what's going on. Right, so that computer model then has a beam rigidly connected to a column, and we've got fixed ends at the left and to the right. And we go do that, we get a whole series of reactions. Right, and from those reactions, we can then go find out these internal forces by putting all the loads back on. 
And when you look, we have a 48 and a 48 in terms of the applied forces. And, but yet the vertical reaction on the left plus the vertical reaction at the right are greater than 96, and that's because, but not by a lot, it's about 97.4 and change or so, and that's because it includes the self-weight of the beam and of the column distributed along its, its length. Now, the, the real computer model, what actually happens is that that self-weight gets uh, divided up between the two ends, and everything done is done as a joint analysis, right? But but that explains at least the basic element of why um, the two vertical reactions are greater than the what seems to be the applied forces. Right? And from there, then, those equilibrium and following through axial forces going through the joint become a shear force in the column, et cetera, et cetera. You end up with then, a moment diagram situation that you see demonstrated here. Now, this is for a model that has the W21 by 44 for the beam. And if you were to use, say, a W21 by uh, 50 for the beam, what you'd find out is that the 161.8 becomes about a 163 and change. Right? So there's not a lot of difference, but there is a little bit. And it's actually kind of surprising that 6 pounds per foot in the beam makes that much of a difference. It's not so much the added weight. That's a little bit of it. It's that the 21 by 50 is a different stiffness than the 21 by 44. And we're going to find out later in the course how significant it is about the relative stiffness of this beam compared to the column is going to influence these this distribution of the moments throughout the system and also the distribution of the other forces as well. Right. Of course, these moment diagrams are drawn on the positive side. Well. That's, that's an awkward way of saying they're drawn on the compression side of the member, meaning that positive bending moment means concave up for the beam, so it looks like that. The negative would be frowny face. And then for the column, then you got to decide, well, what's your positive coordinate system here? I put my little local coordinate system up here at the upper uh, portion of the column, which means x, the axial direction, goes downwards in a positive way. It means that I ought to look at this column like this. Now note, it really doesn't matter what you call negative and positive because the in the US designer sign convention, the member's drawn on the compression side of the member, right? And that compression side means for this instance, hey, it's bending like this, concave down to us now. And remember, plane sections remain plane and hey, this bottom is getting squeezed, the top is getting pulled apart. Tension on the top, compression on the bottom Hey, that oh, T and C. Now, turn this over like that. Notice C is on the left. Tension is the right. We're drawing this on the compression side of the member. Right? With, the, with that moment diagram, then we go back and we draw our qualitative deflected shape. And one of the key things here is that this joint at the upper right, the beam column joint, does rotate in a counterclockwise fashion. Right? But it started off at 90 degrees. It needs to remain at 90 degrees. We have to have a little bit of frowny face to the left of that um, joint. We need frowny face just to the right of the support. And then we have smiley face in the middle. Nice smooth transitions as best you can do with the French curve. And then for the column, even though the computer model will indicate that in this particular case, the column is relatively stiff compared to uh, the beam, and it won't show you much in the way of deflections. We really do have some curvature, and it's reverse curvature that shows up in that column. That's a critical thing. And indeed, in this specific case, we have almost exactly a two to one ra ratio between the moment at the top of the column and the moment at the bottom of the column. That's going to be something that's very important to us that does arise in a lot of different situations as we go along. Now, vis a vis what happened in the earlier tasks, B and C, where we were looking at these two extremes, we thought that the maximum moment would be somewhere between 144 and 180. And we ended up at about 162, 163. That's a little bit closer to the 180, which means that the column was, in some sense, actually a little bit on the flexible side. 
it's kind of weird when you look at the deflections and everything. Uh, you can't just only look at the deflections from the computer model because note that these moments are smaller. So of course the beam, the column is going to deflect a little bit less than what the the beam did, right? So got to be careful how you're you're balancing all that out. The max moment, though, note that is the key one. 144 to 180 was our bounding, and it turned out that that was a little bit closer to the pin uh, condition here, meaning the column was fairly flexible as we went along. It also means that we might, at 163, not need to have a 21 by 44, and um, we might be able to, to, to choose a lighter uh, beam as we, as we go along.